Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be talking about uh, Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri who is currently in New York heading the Egyptian delegation for the UN Security Council. The council is headed by Egypt for this round. We're also going to be talking about this council, this meeting, shedding light on fighting terrorism and all the challenges facing the UN Security Council for this round. Also, we're going to be talking about the terrorism, combating terrorism in general, whether inside Egypt or outside of Egypt. We're going to be tackling all these files in tonight's edition of the Daily Debate. But before we start, uh, let me welcome our distinguished guest, uh, Ambassador Mohammed Anis Salim, the member of the Foreign Council, uh, Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let's check out uh, this report regarding uh, Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri actually heading the delegation in New York for the UN Security Council in, uh, of Egypt, and we'll be right back. Sameh Shukri traveled to New York on Monday for a three-day visit to head the Egyptian delegation at the UN Security Council sessions, including a meeting on counterterrorism next Wednesday. Shukri will participate in the Council's open debate at the ministerial level about fighting the ideological discourse of terrorist organizations, which the Foreign Minister's spokesperson, Ahmed Abu Zaid, described as the most important event in which the Foreign Minister will be participating. According to a foreign ministry statement, the session will be attended by the foreign ministers of the member countries of the Security Council, in addition to the rest of the members of the UN, a session which was initiated by Egypt, as Egyptian Amr Abdel Latif is the council president for May. In a press briefing, Abdel Latif has said that Shukri would participate in the open debate on threats to international peace and security caused by terrorist acts on May the 11th. The foreign minister will also hold bilateral meetings with his counterparts from Hungary, the Netherlands, Argentina, Norway and New Zealand, the Danish UN General Assembly President Mojens Leikertoft and a number of candidates for the post of Secretary General. Shukri will attend a high-level discussion of the General Assembly on activities required to consolidate peacekeeping and peacebuilding. A meeting with UN Arab Group will also be held with Shukri in order to discuss a number of issues on the Security Council agenda as Egypt is currently the Arab Group representative at the Security Council. The top diplomat also sits for interviews with foreign newspapers and news agencies. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and now starting our discussion with Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency. Now, Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri is taking part in the UN Security Council in New York for three days. Uh, generally, what would you say are the main topics uh, being discussed in the agenda of uh, the Egyptian delegation for this uh, UN Security Council? Uh, th there is a, an agenda for work mm -hmm. for the Security Council for the whole month of May. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, the uh, chairmanship rotates every month from yes. one country to or member state of mm -hmm. the Security Council to the next. Uh, th this month is quite rich. It covers uh, issues like uh, uh, follow up on some of the uh, long standing crises in the, re in the world, like the Middle East, for example. Mm -hmm. Also, other things like Liberia, uh, Somalia. There is a going, there's going to be a uh, Security Council mission to, to update on the situation uh, in Somalia. Uh, that there are some other issues. One of them is the issue of uh, looking at peacekeeping operations. Mm -hmm. Egypt played a very important role in some of the preparatory meetings towards the Security Council review of peacekeeping uh, operations. There is also a very important review in the General Assembly. Mm -hmm that uh, will be ta taking place shortly. So uh, together, all of these issues gives you a very, very wide range of uh, international problems which the, uh, the Security Council is seized with. Yes. Well, before we start delving into the main issues uh, that will be discussed for this round, um, now the last time Egypt was uh, heading the UN uh, Security Council was in 1996, which is about 20 years ago. So. How different do you think the Egyptian participation will be 
in the UN Security Council. We, we have a non-permanent uh, seat now, which was in a way a landmark to actually get it after all the, the, the past few years of political uncertainty and turmoil. How different do you think the Egyptian performance will be this time around uh, compared to 1996? The technicalities of chairing don't give you that much room to influence the debate. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the change has happened in the way the world has changed. That the issues, for example, if you look at the issues of the Middle East, one of the very significant things when you look at the agenda of work of the Security Council is that Middle East issues are taking a lot of time and, and space. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's significant, I think, that Middle East issues have occupied the world for such a long period of time mm -hmm. and have taken on a characteristic of being uh, difficult to resolve. Mm -hmm. So you see issues that are not going away that were in, fa in fact on the agenda of the Security Council now for ages. Somalia, mm -hmm. for example, uh, yeah, Liberia, mm -hmm. or uh, Darfur. Mm -hmm. All of these issues are, the or, or of, of course, the Middle well. East, of course, mm -hmm. goes without saying. So uh, one of the very significant things is this inability of the Security Council to actually resolve some of the long-standing conflicts. Now, what we're seeing also in the, the way the UN works mm -hmm. is that there's more concentration of power in the Security Council vis-a-vis -vis for uh, compared by the General Assembly. And this is not really the way the, uh, the founding fathers of the organization looked at it. They saw it much more as a, a democratic institution open to, to uh, all states, uh, an institution that would take a leadership role in resolving issues mm -hmm. of peace and security. We're not seeing that happen. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that there is a certain weakness of resolve. We're seeing also that a lot of issues are being tackled outside the Security Council, mm -hmm. outside the United Nations. So there is a, a need for a big reform process. This is a complex issue. It will not be resolved during the period where Egypt is a member mm -hmm. of the Security Council, but it's, it's one that we should be uh, taking an interest in and also helping to resolve. Yes. Well, you've pointed out to um, a very common criticism of uh, the UN institution uh, in general and the UN Security Council, which is not really taking decisive or concrete steps or decisions that would be applied in the political life worldwide. Uh, and Foreign Minister Samah Shukri actually noted today saying that the way things are being, uh, decisions are being made and things being dealt with within the UN Security Council should witness a real change. Do you think that we will witness any sort of real change? Because as you've mentioned, a lot of decisions are being taken and implemented outside of the UN body. And at the same time, approaching a new era with a new uh, Secretary General, do you think things will change? A lot of change is linked to the uh, uh, consensus of opinion between the five permanent members. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, a difficult relationship because uh, there are a lot of uh, global conflicts between those and uh, it's difficult for them to reach a consensus. When they do reach a consensus, things can move quickly. Look at Syria. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the fact that the uh, US and Russia have managed to get together has give, given an impetus. It's, it's difficult, it's mm -hmm. frustrating, but there is a political process that has been absent for the last five years. Uh, whether we can replicate that in other complex issues, for example, the Middle East, mm -hmm. for example, Yemen, for example, Iraq, can we do this or whether we cannot? This is an, it's, it's, it's difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep trying. We need to see also where is it that we can move forward within our regional context. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible, for example, to establish Arab peacekeeping operations using the expertise of the United Nations? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to use Arab observer forces? Uh, is it possible to uh, create uh, zones of peace in the region? Is it possible to create mediation bodies? Uh, how can we engage more and more with our own region? Because if you look at some of the issues in the Middle East, you'll see that there is an absence of an Arab role. If you look at the mediators, for example, on the different conflicts in the Middle East, they are all from the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh,
them are not non-Arab, with the exception of one, the one working on, on Yemen. Mm -hmm. But you would look at people, even if you look at issues like the internal situation in Yemen, in, in, in Lebanon, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the Arab role in this? There needs to be an Arab role. If you look at the, for example, the confrontation with Daesh, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to find an, a, a clear regional Arab role. Uh, it, there was a symbolic Arab role at a certain stage, and then it diminished and vanished. Mm -hmm. Where is the initiative? Where is the, uh, uh, the resolution really to tackle this? That, that needs to uh, materialize. Yes. Well, Egypt now heading the, uh, the UN Security Council for this month. Everyone really, uh, was really excited about Egypt getting the non-permanent seat. But do you feel that in not necessarily at least this month, but in general, do you think that obtaining this seat, we will be actually able to uh, really shed the spotlight on a lot of the Arab and African issues uh, that would be of great importance to the African continent within the UN? Or do you, th do you feel that it's mainly, uh, mainly a, a formality or a ceremonial uh, post for everyone in Egypt and around the Middle East to celebrate. Do you think that when Egypt is heading now the uh, UN Security Council, can we actually force any sort of decision making? It obviously has to deal with the uh, five permanent members, but do you feel that Egypt now has a lot of uh, influence, a really big role by an Arab country within the UN Security Council? As I said before, the, the Security Council, we're talking about 15 member states, mm -hmm. with five uh, uh, having a very special role because mm -hmm. they have a veto power over whatever decision. Yes. So if there's any decision they don't like, they can stop it right there. Uh, so you, by necessity, you are a member of a big team. Uh, to what extent can you bring new angles in this, new perspectives, new ideas, new proposals? Not too much because the agenda of work is shaped by years and years of, of, uh, of follow-up and, and issues that have been opened and formulated uh, and institutionalized by certain ways. So you have, for example, sanctions uh, that are uh, in place against the country, country A. Mm -hmm. Then you have a sanctions committee that is reporting to the Security Council on the implementation of these sanctions and whether these sanctions should be renewed or discontinued. Mm -hmm. So you have, and you have so many other instruments. If you look at the agenda of work, you'd be surprised at the number of follow-up steps on former, mm -hmm. previous resolutions. Mm -hmm. So there isn't that much of room for you, but you have an area of perspective. For example, the discussion of tomorrow, mm -hmm. which is about the narrative and the ideology of terrorist operations. This is an area which Egypt feels, uh, it, Egypt has an interest in this. It has pushed this issue to bring it to the Security Council. It has a say because it has expertise in understanding that terrorism is, only, is not only the terrorist act, but there is a narrative that leads to the emergence of terrorist organizations, to the recruitment of young people mm -hmm. within countries, to the recruitment of what's called foreign fighters who are uh, uh, at, uh, uh, brought from other countries mm -hmm. to join conflicts and to uh, commit uh, 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 terrorist acts. Mm -hmm. There is a historical narrative. We know that it, it goes back to uh, uh, read uh, writings of people like Maududi and mm -hmm. Sayyid Utb and so on, and there yes. are different organizations. Egypt understands this, it has an experience with it. It also knows about the de-radicalization programs, uh, where uh, uh, terrorists have been trained to uh, uh, de-radicalize, mm -hmm. to uh, forego their former ideology of uh, extremism, mm -hmm. and to join the main discourse of, uh, of democratic politics. Mm -hmm. So many of the experiences that Egypt has will be relevant for the debate uh, that's taking place. These can be reflected eventually in decisions like, for example, whether organization A, B, or C will be listed as a terrorist organization, and whether uh, different states will take actions, mm -hmm. concrete actions, against members 
of these organizations, or to stop the activities, or mm -hmm. to stop supporting, or to be careful about what happens when you start a, um, a, a TV station, for example, mm -hmm. that is uh, 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 carrying messages that are, uh, are strengthening this narrative. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, these kind of issues are areas where Egypt can have an influence. Yes. Well, the UN Security Council has 15 uh, member states. Now, talking about the most influential, the five permanent members, Egypt, we've seen over the past uh, year or so that Egypt has been really strengthening its ties with countries such as uh, Russia, uh, China, France. And these are countries that seem to be on maybe the same wavelength and on the same page as Egypt in regards to how to fight and combat. And especially, as you've mentioned, Egypt has a lot of the know-how to... Uh, to really stop uh, the emergence, at least, or backtrack uh, the, the, the emergence and the radicalization of these groups. But what about other member states that we're not quite sure how they would stand? Because you, you said that nobody has seen still uh, a strong Arab coalition that could be uh, fighting extremism and the terrorism uh, around the world not just the Middle East, but also because we've seen the terrorist acts happen all over the world in, in European countries and uh, in the Western community as well. Do you feel like countries such as the US, uh, the US administration, are they on the same wavelength uh, as Egypt and Russia and China and France and actually how to combat uh, the extremism? Or is there another agenda that we should be uh, worry about? Do you think they could veto some sort of uh, a decision that might be taken by the UN Security Council for this month? I don't think you have anything that's that controversial that will be uh, take you to a veto. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, 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 the work method of the Security Council is now designed to avoid vetoes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that this kind of dialogue creates areas of consensus, of growing consensus. Mm -hmm. Uh, incidentally, I don't think that there's a 100% uh, uh, kind of uh, agreement with mm -hmm. all of the five members between us and, any, you know, and the countries you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there will always be areas of, of diversions. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, can, can you focus on the principal th areas where you can designate, for example, who is a terrorist and who isn't a terrorist? There has been a historical problem in defining terrorism. Mm -hmm. There has been a problem in pragmatic uh, issues like uh, which organization inside Syria mm -hmm. should be part of the peace process and which should be marginalized, mm -hmm. which should be part of a ceasefire and which should not. Eventually, which will be subject to sanctions and uh, international uh, law uh, in the future because there must be accountability for these acts. One day, there will be accountability for all these acts of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And who should be stand trial and who should not? So mm -hmm. there are a lot of issues that will come out. Uh, I think the dialogue is useful. I think it's important to be uh, open-minded and progressive. But it's also important to understand the, uh, the mindsets of many of the countries we are dealing with. If you look at the West, for example, you would see that there, na there is a narrative now in the West that the idea of external intervention has not succeeded. It has not succeeded with the Russians in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It has not been a great success story for the Americans in Afghanistan. It has been a disaster for the Americans in Iraq. It has been uh, not very good for the Europeans uh, leading the charge in Libya. Mm -hmm. Now, this has led to a huge amount of hesitation to, to have boots on the ground. That the public opinion in the West doesn't want to see new wars and doesn't want to see coffins coming home. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you face the reality of terrorism in, in situations like this? How do you face the reality of Daesh, for example, in Libya? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the, uh, the emerging government is not uh, the big, you know, uh, seizing authority that, that fast. It will be very optimistic to expect them to deal with Daesh on their own. Mm -hmm. What degree of foreign or international intervention will be able to address this? How will it happen? Within what time spectrum? Under what conditions? 
what kind of regime will you have once you finish an operation? All of these are issues which are very open and they're, they're difficult for Western countries. They're difficult also for the Arab world because mm -hmm. the Arab world doesn't know what to do about it. Yes, well, it, as you've mentioned, if, they, if they've seen that the foreign intervention has not been a, a successful story in all of these places, do you think that they could change their mindset and say, well, maybe the Arabs should fix it. I mean, they would know how to deal with it better. But then again, if if, a lot, if, if an Arab coalition actually intervened in uh, crises such as what's happening in Syria or Libya, afterwards, do you think the Arab countries will be able to help a government stand up and be recognized and take matters of their country in, in their own hands? Well, you know, the problem here is really a problem of capacity. If you look at the Arab League today, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the tool set to address this. It doesn't have a security capable of taking decisions on security issues. It doesn't have a military mechanism. It doesn't have much experience in peacekeeping. If you compare that, for example, to the African Union, you'll see that the African Union has at least tried to work uh, in Burundi. It tried to work in uh, Somalia. Mm -hmm. It tried to work in Darfur. Mm -hmm. And it worked because it brought in the expertise of the United Nations. It got support from the EU. And it created a joint force and, uh, and managed to intervene. I don't see the Arab world getting on this track at all. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem of capacity. And this, this uh, process of building capacity has to start someday. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's been, we've been very late at addressing this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, we've mentioned uh, the UN and the UN Security Council not really being as effective uh, as the whole world would want it to be. Also, the Arab League has, has really didn't really live up to the expectations of taking the Arab matters into their own hands and uh, actually achieving some sort of progress. Mm -hmm. So how effective, how important is it for these summits and these meetings and these international bodies to actually make a difference in the world? Or should we, should we mainly rely on individual countries or some sort of correlations being formed between uh, different groups of countries to actually make a difference? There is a trend in the world, not only in the Arab world, but it's very clear in the Arab world, of creating temporary coalitions. Mm -hmm. Coalitions of the willing, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, you'll see uh, Russians, the Iraqis, the Syrians, and the Iranians putting together a coalition mm -hmm. uh, to around the issue of fighting Daesh. Mm -hmm. You'll see another coalition which has been put together with the, uh, lead, under the leadership of Americans to, again, to fight Daesh. You'll see uh, uh, a lot of bilateral pacts. You'll see the Turks with the Qataris, the Turks with the Saudis. Uh, I, I think that's a trend which will continue. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, you see that regional organizations that have a basic function in terms of peace and security in their region, at least, mm -hmm. are failing in their duty. And where do you stop this trend? Where do you start the repair process? Mm -hmm. And how do you do it? I would say you need also to go step by step. I think the step that was proposed uh, last year of creating a joint Arab force has not worked because it was too ambitious. Mm -hmm. You need to go the gradually. It will be slow, but at least you're on, you're on a winning curve. Mm -hmm. And that's much better than this stop-start uh, issue. Whether you can, you, you pose a very good question about whether these temporary coalitions could play a role in fixing the system. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a, a good point there. Definitely, the Egyptian-Saudi relation has this potential. Mm -hmm. uh, it has some though, because the Arab, the Joint Arab Force has stopped because of Saudi objections. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia has led the intervention in Yemen. I'm not sure to what extent, you know, this is managed in a in a uh, uh, an effective manner. Uh, Saudi Arabia has called for an Islamic coalition. I'm not sure to what extent this is uh, in line with Egyptian policy. Egypt's policy has always been to work within the Arab context. Mm -hmm. The idea of Arab nationalism, the Arab League, these were the, the years of work of Egypt uh, when it comes particularly to issues of peace and security. So there is some
problem here that if the main players in the region cannot agree on the basics of the problems and how to address them, then somehow these temporary coalitions also will, will have a problem. Yes. Well, talking about combating terrorism, an Arab or a Middle Eastern uh, problem, but also uh, a global one. Uh, we've seen a lot of attacks taking place in Belgium, taking place in Paris. So within these sessions uh, for this month, it won't be just Arab countries and Egypt proposing uh, ideas and ways to fight co uh, and combat terrorism, but also Western co countries such as the US, such as France, uh, Russia, Germany, all these countries, they will probably also have some ideas that they would want to propose uh, for this session. We've seen the, the, the NATO uh, coalition, we've seen the airstrikes uh, carried out by uh, the United States and Russia, but not really uh, tangible, concrete solutions that have been achieved. Do you, what sort of ideas do you expect these countries to propose to the table? If you look at the kind of background to this, if you look to the issues like previous Security Council resolutions, uh, some of the reports that were prepared by the Secretariat in preparation for some of these discussions in previous sessions of the Security Council, some of the concept papers, now one of the mechanism, interesting mechanisms that uh, uh, the Security Council is working with is that a certain state, a member state, will present a concept note Mm -hmm. to inform the discussion. This, uh, this concept note is, is not necessarily reflective of the consensus of the Council, but is meant to be an instrument to assist the discussion. And if you look at this material, you see some of Western thinking on these issues. For example, one of the issues that the West has been very keen on is to make sure that fighting terrorism does not mean transgressions on human rights. Mm -hmm. For example, that's, that's one of the issues. Uh, you will hear voices countering this and saying that uh, this is not realistic, that in practice it's, it's so there is a right there. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see uh, uh, issues where some states will say that for us a certain organization is uh, terrorist, a terrorist organization and should not be touched by others. For example, what the Turks are saying about PKK. Mm -hmm that this Kurdish movement for, uh, the, for the government in Ankara is seen as a terrorist organization. Uh, meanwhile, other, other parties, for example, the United States, a member of NATO, a close ally of Turkey, is supporting PKK because they say PKK is a main ally in the fight against Daesh. Mm -hmm. So issues are more complex. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, sometimes I'm worried about the way issues are presented in uh, the Egyptian media because they are often presented as black and white issues where so-and-so uh, is against us and so-and-so is, is running a conspiracy against us. But I think we get go deep into issues because mm -hmm. the issues are much more complex than they appear and the, often the answers are not so simple. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, um, one issue has been always uh, being discussed in the UN and the UN Security Council, which is the Palestinian issue. Uh, now, in light of yesterday's meeting between uh, President Sisi and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, and also uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas met with Foreign Minister Samah Shukri, do you think that Egypt can do something about it while heading the UN Security Council? Do you think that there will be some sort of a new angle, at least, to tackle uh, the Palestinian uh, cause, or is this an ongoing soap opera that we will be witnessing with no real concrete solutions taking place? If you look at the Palestinian issue and try to identify what are the new factors mm -hmm. in the next few weeks, you'll see that uh, is the issue of the uh, quartet presenting its report. Mm -hmm and uh, uh, the expectation that the report will be, on the one hand, uh, more critical of Israeli settlement policy, but uh, opening the door for a search for a new dynamic mm -hmm. to push the field. You also see the French talking about putting together a new initiative, even if uh, the, the, uh, the are not willing to cooperate with this. And mm -hmm. the question is, um, 
can some of the mechanisms we have seen used to energize the Syrian negotiation? Can some of these mechanisms be replicated in the way uh, the Middle East issue is being tackled? Mm -hmm. Can there be a meeting of states, not necessarily in the conflict, so a meeting where not attended by the Israelis and the Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, something similar to what happened in Vienna 1 and Vienna 2 on mm -hmm. Syria before mm -hmm. the Geneva Conference was reconvened? Yes. Uh, that is a possibility. Is there a possibility of holding a special session on the Security Council with a, issuing a new mandate? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one dynamic. The other dynamic, one always when you talk about the Palestinian issue, is where will the American administration be vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis that kind of initiative? Mm -hmm. You have a, a president who is a lame duck who is thinking of his uh, uh, legacy and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how he will depart the picture. I see today I was reading that he has decided to go to uh, Hiroshima, mm -hmm. which is a historical step mm -hmm. for any American. It has unprecedented. Yes. And uh, it, is a, it is a huge step in the global context of uh, reconciliation between peoples. But I do not see uh, a huge willingness and initiative in the remaining months of this presidency. Who will be the next president? Whether that president will want to uh, indulge in the Middle East or whether to continue with the Obama policy of disengagement? Mm -hmm. These are open questions. Yes. So there is always the question with the, uh, going back to the French initiative, mm -hmm. is this to tread on water and waste time mm -hmm. while there is the shift of power in, in Washington. Yes. Some Europeans are saying that any new American president will need to become more engaged in the Middle East, will need to discontinue the Obama policy of uh, uh, dis Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll definitely be following up the developments taking place over the next two days in New York at the UN Security Council, where Egypt is heading the uh, month of May round for the Council. And before we go, I'd like to very distinguished guest, Ambassador Mohammed Eni Selim, the member of the Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much you. for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to uh, head to our next. Uh, topic of tonight talking about actually fighting terrorism in Egypt and a little bit outside of its borders. Uh, let's check out this report regarding uh, many reports say that a lot of terrorists have fled Sinai Peninsula and went to Libya and we'll be right back. belonging to Ansar Beit al-Maqdis have fled Sinai. Extremists steadily crossed over the Egyptian Libyan past barren deserts and bumpy roads. Boarding trafficking vessels, Libyan security sources revealed that some of the terrorists had entered the country by sea. However, after entering Libya, terrorist groups had become notorious for incursions and internal strife. Disputes turned into bloodshed in Tripoli. Only two weeks ago, among other reported prominent Egyptian figurehead called Sheikh Marwan being killed. The group soon fell apart, crumbling into smaller brawling groups which were unsettled on whether to pledge allegiance to Daesh, Al-Qaeda or the Brotherhood terrorist group. Amongst the three embattled groups are Al-Asaili group, Al-Basal and Abu Al-Muhajir. The group was founded by a citizen originating from Port Said. It has taken roots in Libya two months ago, spreading in each of Tripoli and Homs. This group is affiliated with Al-Qaeda, Libyan offshoots. For al-Basal originally sprouting from Sinai, the group has only arrived to Libya a month ago. Most terrorists belonging to this faction are active in Musrata, which is a city in the Musrata district in northwestern Libya. On multiple occasions, they've also proved loyal to the Brotherhood terrorist organization. Last but not least, Abu al-Muhajir, one of the most highlighted groups of Ansar Beit al-Maqdis, has recently left Libya, and it is believed that the faction is led by a barred Egyptian officer. The group has taken headquarters in Sirte, which is a city located halfway between Tripoli and Benghazi, and has raised the Daesh flag. <laughs> 